Good evening, everybody. My name is Sarah Robinson, and I'm a proud citizen of the Fort Nelson First Nation and the Soto First Nation in Northern BC's Treaty 8 territory. And I'm honored to be here today in Kwanalan Dun and Ton Kwachan territory to speak with you about Indigenous women and the, his, the story of Canada. An Indigenous author named Thomas King once said, the truth about stories is that's all we are. And the story I'd like to talk with you about today begins a few hundred years before Confederation. We're in Europe. A strange and exotic new world has just been discovered where a man can be a man. He's an adventurer, an explorer, the king of the wild frontier. And in this story, travel and exploration are the male space and undiscovered and unknown lands are the female space. These new lands are the home of beautiful native princesses chilling out in meadows and glens with wolves or bare-breasted warrior women with spears uh, riding exotic animals. And they're ready for exploration, and so is the land. And in this story, the land has become a beautiful woman who's there for the taking. From Pocahontas to Avatar, we've all heard a version of this story. But we know what happens when people and cultures come together. We relate to one another and we judge one another based on our own personal stories, our values, and quite simply, what we're used to. So explorers came here with predetermined Euro-Christian ideas about women and appropriate feminine behavior. Uh, so delicate females dependent on fathers, husbands, brothers, men, women and children as accessories to men, and men as the, house, as the head of households, the education system, politics, and society as a whole. So although virgin princesses were understandable and somehow realistic in their minds, uh, upon arrival, indigenous societies that were women-centered, uh, matrilineal, or where women worked or were equal to men, were completely unacceptable or even comprehensible. So our story takes a turn. Post-contact, indigenous women uh, were, neither, were no longer exotic princesses, and the land was no longer a wild frontier. In fact, things seem kind of backwards here. These poor working women need rescue, civilization, and salvation. And because the land is the woman, the land needs civilization too. And this is the important moment when our story changed because explorers' uh, judgmental perceptions about indigenous women and peoples became the literature and the history that we continue to base our world on today. Their stories became all that we are. And the subjective has become the truth. And what is perceived to be the truth would go on to shape this emerging country's ideology, institutions, legislation, and the future. So the story approaches confederation, and with it, the development of policies that transformed Euro-Christian Euro values into Canadian law. Some of these policies were amalgamated into the 1876 Indian Act, which, among other things, defined a person as anyone other than an Indian, and created Indian status, which could only be handed down through Indigenous men. This meant that if a Native woman married a non-Native man, she and her children, legally and in the eyes of our young Canadian government, were no longer Native. And if there are fewer Native people in the eyes of the government, uh, it helps justify the takeover of land because nobody's using it anyway. So federal law, rooted in these Euro-Christian ideals, devalued Indigenous women by treating us as accessories to men at the will of men. And this means that we experience colonization in a very different way than men do, because we're doubly discriminated against, first on the basis of race, and then on the basis of gender. Our gender depression through law not only allowed for the takeover of indigenous lands, but also led to sexual violence at the hands of those who upheld the law. Examples being police giving starving families food in order to gain access to the native women of those families, and Indian agents providing rations in exchange for sexual favors. This matters because in this story, a direct relationship has emerged between racist and sexist stereotypes, the solidification of those stereotypes in law, and violence against Indigenous women and girls, which continues through to today. So in Canada today, about half of all women experience violence in some way or another, but Indigenous women are three times more likely to experience violence than even that, and are eight times more likely for that violence to end in their murder. Right now, there are over 5,000 murdered and missing Indigenous women across Canada, and I encourage you when you're leaving today, once you go out those doors, to turn right, and you'll see a beautiful, um, honoring our sisters exhibition or memorial that's just right outside on the right-hand side. 
Recently, Amnesty International released a report called Out of Sight, Out of Mind that examines the negative impact of resource development and work camps on Indigenous women in northeastern BC and their safety. Perhaps work camps are the new frontier. But the story continues, and before we know it, we find ourselves at a 150th birthday party. But if the truth about stories is that's all we are, then right now every person in this room is a character and an author in the chapter that we're sitting in. And if our stories become history, then we are history, and you can help make it better, and Canadians can. So how can you do that, and where can you start? Number one, learn about Indigenous cultures and the true history of Canada beyond what you may or may not have learned in a textbook. I work all across Canada, and 99% of Canadians I meet tell me that they want to know more, but they don't know where to start, they're embarrassed they don't already know more, or they're afraid to ask questions because they don't want to offend anybody. So if any of you in the room are feeling that today, know that you're not alone. <laughs> A good place to start uh, for more information is uh, the University of British Columbia's Indigenous Studies program, of which I am, I am an alumni, has a website with some foundational information that you can skim through to start, www.indigenousfoundations.arts.ubc.ca. And they did not ask me to say that. <laughs> Number two, if you want to know more, find me on Twitter or email, and I personally commit to pointing you in the direction of more information and resources. Number three, put your newfound knowledge into practice at election time. This includes provincial and federal. <laughs> Thank you. This includes provincial and federal elections as well as municipal elections. Today, about 60% of Indigenous peoples live in urban centres, and cities must lead reconciliation. So, when you're deciding which party to vote for, examine their platform as it relates to Indigenous women and peoples. And if you don't see us on there, ask yourself why. <laughs> Number four is acknowledge that nothing, nothing, is blind to gender and then go find out what that means. Number five, and most importantly, we must collectively, you, me, everybody, hold ourselves to higher moral standards than our forefathers. And to do this is simple, is to embrace the platinum rule, treat other people the way that they want to be treated. Imagine how different our story, our 150 years, and world history would be, can be, if everybody embraces the simple human approach. Every person in this room can help write a new country that our daughters will be proud of. So I challenge you to imagine the history we can have and go write it. Thank you.